Welcome back to the channel. I'm glad you're here today. We're shooting here in the deep in the bowels of the Ken McAuliffe Jazz Vinyl Lover Man Cave. You can see uh, behind me directly a rack of records. Then over here, we have a loft, which is full of hi-fi boxes. And over here, we can see a hallway that runs down to my door. And before that, you see a big exposed beam. When I first moved in this apartment, I wanted to take out all the walls and just have one big open space. But I realized that where I'm sitting, there's literally nothing holding up the roof above my head because the lady who lived here before me um, was kind of a quack. And apparently she wouldn't let workmen come in and replace the beams after they had all rotted out. Why they haven't been replaced since is another New York story, but there you have it. But today I wanted to uh, alert you. I've been on a real uh, voyage of discovery about the last month. We got in a large collection at Jazz Record Center that was bought in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, the historical district. We pulled a big collection out of this building that on the outside was just a beautiful facade, a classic uh, red brick structure. Looks sort of like a castle. Once we got inside, it was uh, crumbling and falling apart and there were boxes of records everywhere. Uh, Fred Cohen, the owner of the store, used the word remarkable to describe this collection. And he's never used that word before. We picked up lots of collections in the area. And I saw the records that he pulled out that go straight to auction. And they were just breathtaking. Sealed first pressing blue notes of every era. Sealed prestige records. Sealed verve records. Just really, there were bags full of sealed records. This fellow who passed away was 90 years old and had amassed a huge collection. But as Fred started putting records out into the store... You know, when I first went to work at his store in 1990, full-time, I just worked there one day a week now. I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be there, actually, because my schedule is just nuts. Um, but we would have a lot of these labels I'm about to talk about, uh, such as Muse and Arista Freedom and Enja and Black Jazz and Catalyst and Artist House and Cobblestone and Inner City and Muse and Mainstream and Xanadu. All of these records... Well, I, I cover this in my upcoming Stereophile review where I talk about this because I use these records in the review. So I will just read this paragraph I wrote to give you a little heads up on the records I'm going to show you. And I titled this bit of a review, A 70s Jazz Fairy Tale. Standard jazz history states that when fusion became popular about 1971, the market for crusty swingers like Dexter Gordon and Hank Mobley dried up and they hightailed it to Europe. Many of them never came back. Kenny Clark never came back. Alvin Queen still lives in Europe. Um, you know, when, when Dexter Gordon came back in the mid-80s, mid it was a big deal. Dexter was coming back from uh, Europe. Anyway, they hightailed to Europe, and after that, jazz was essentially dead until Wynton Marsalis and the Young Lions rescued it in the 1980s. Well, that's pure media BS. A lot of people bought into it. I bought into it until I went to the work of the right Jazz Record Center. Such 1970s indie labels as Black Jazz, Ovation, Strata East, Catalyst, Artist House, Cobblestone, Inner City, Muse, Mainstream, Xanadu, and Groove Merchant continued to record talented jazz, jazz heads, many drenched in hard bop, but willing to embrace what some now call spiritual jazz, as well as funk and world music. In parentheses, there was also a more avant-garde movement taking place. Um, which is still under-documented as far as reissues go, but artists like Horace Tapscott, Art Ensemble Chicago, Black Artist Group, and the labels Arista Freedom, Enja, and ECM Records, they all explored more esoteric uh, jazz territory. ECM being pretty, um, you know, easy to get into for the average jazz person that, in that time. But we're speaking of artists such as, who stayed in the States, who continued to make great jazz on small labels, keyboardists Mickey Tucker, Neil Creaky, and Charles Earling, guitarist Roland Prince, Calvin Keyes, O'Donnell Levy, and Pat Martino, of course, saxophonist Charles McPherson, Eric Kloss, and Hadley Calliman. All of these people expanded jazz's straight-ahead boundaries while retaining U.S. passports. A particularly interesting case study to me, um, I found all these records in the collection, guitarist Mel Brown recorded on Impulse, created some of the nastiest, funkiest blues skank this side of Lightning Hopkins. So my feeling is there's nothing wrong with buying your tone poets and your craft reissues. You know, if you want to spend 35 bucks on another tone poet, get out there. But if you want to dig a little deeper 
into what was happening in the U.S. after 1970, up through the late 1970s, you can find most of these records on Discogs for a song, because they are not popular, but they are happening funky records. And I'm just going to run through a few. Some of these artists you'll know very well, obviously. Blue Mitchell. This was a revelation to me, Norman Connors, who I knew as a drummer. Uh, but this record is beautiful, super funky, lots of great jazz improvisation. I've spoken often of this record, George Duke's Feel, um, which is a psychedelic, earthy, jazz funk record. Of course, Pat Martino. If you're not hip to Pat Martino, get out there and buy these records. They're prestige muse in the early 1970s. Great. Uh, he had a wonderful, uh, very lyrical 16th note bass style. Roland Prince, a guitarist on Vanguard. <clears throat> All these records are essentially jazz records with long improvisations, but they do include funk. They in include <clears throat> allusions to not free jazz, but definitely spiritual music. Alice Coltrane was still a very big influence in the early 70s in New York City. Guitarist, Leon Spencer. This is on Prestige, Purple Label. Many of you are already hip to O'Donnell Levy. All of his records are fantastic, funky, great playing, great arrangements. This was a really wild record I found. Bob Moses, <clears throat> Bittersweet in the Ozone. Bob Moses, the drummer who played on Pat Metheny's first record, and did a lot of great experimental stuff. A real outlier in jazz who did some really important work. The great Mickey Tucker, who I was not really aware of at all, cut a series of records on Muse. They're dirt cheap, this was 10 bucks. And he's a wonderful straight ahead player, but the arrangements go other places and he's willing to experiment. Great musicians, like the players on this record, for example. Frank Foster, Cecil Bridgewater, Pepper Adams, Cecil McBee, Eddie Gladden, Ray Mantia, and Azidin Weston on Conga. So, I mean, a serious lineup, but it's not the standard. This music is less coming out of Miles' great quintet than coming out of just what was happening in the 70s. Everything is expanding, everything is changing. I've often said, and I've seen other people sort of echo it, that the 60s weren't really over in spirit until about 1973. That spirit of exploration, of moving forward, of expansion was still there. Another Mickey Tucker record, I think this might be his first record, triplicate on Muse, Jimmy Ponder, Gene Perla, the great bassist, Eddie Gladden. Richard Groove Holmes, these albums are very common. They're not all great. Teddy Edwards, Pat Martino, Paul Chambers, Billy Higgins. In, in the whole organ thing, there's a lot of organ records that were very popular. Jack McDuff, Richard Groove Holmes, Charles Kennard, Charles Ireland. Some of these are really great. Some of them, like I've never been a Don Patterson fan. I feel like those records just don't go anywhere. I almost feel the same way about Willis Jackson. We have a bunch of Willis Jackson records in the store now. And unlike Lou Donaldson, who kind of makes a beautiful statement every time he plays and seems serious, Willis Jackson, almost always those records turn into party records, except the very earliest records on Prestige. Now this is the guy I was talking about, Mel Brown, On Impulse. These are quintessential funk, blues, jazz records. I, I can't explain how great these records are. With the rhythm, rhythm sections and other players I've never heard of. It's Impulse, but it's recorded in LA. Some of them are very funny. I was listening to one the other day. I was interviewing John DeVore for an upcoming video we, I'm gonna do about his speakers, his new speakers. And it sounds like they got the singer off the side of the street. The guy's going, I'm going down to the airport and like the slow funk thing behind him. But if you can find these Mel Brown records, I'd rather smack, suck my thumb. There's about six of them on Impulse. They are just quintessential early 70s funk jazz records. And they are just popping, incredible grooves. We'll keep going. Thornell Shorts on Argo. Shout out to my buddy, Dan the Jazz Shepherd, who trumpets Argo records. And this is one of the great ones. Um, Thornell Shorts with Bill Leslie. This is just a slow burning, boiling, cooking kind of record. Thornell Schwartz. All these records are like 10 bucks, 15 bucks. Here's another Mel Brown record, Chicken Fat. 
that's what those records are right. They're greasy. They got chicken fat. Bobby Pierce, uh, an organist and a vocalist, and he does like funky versions of uh, Ode to Billy Joe, and just you know, it's it borders on hackneyed and corny, but it's not. And the bands are great. Bobby Jones, Pat Martino, Bob Cranshaw, and Rob Brooks. Cobblestone did a lot of really great records. I don't know who owned Cobblestone. I know it started in the early 70s. Most of these labels by 1978 were dead and they were gone. But this is such a cool, funky, happening record. Another Mel Brown record, Blues for We. This album has a giant horn section that is just like so in your face. And the tunes are happening and... At the end of one side, there's a lot groove of horns, which just kind of blew my mind. It's an experimental record. Mel Brown had an experimental head thing going on. Another Mickey Tucker record on Muse, The Crawl. Marcus Belgrave, Junior Cook, Ted Dunbar, Slide Hampton, Billy Hart, Earl May, Crankin maybe. I mean, great New York players. Charles Irland, Leaving This Planet. Most people are familiar with Charles Irland. This is a great pivotal record. Harvey Mason on drums. This is kind of a collectible record. I think it's been sampled a lot. Walter Bishop Jr. from the early 70s with Billy Hart and Sam Jones on bass. This is more of a straight ahead record, but they're playing with it. You know, it's experimental. Pat Martino will be together again. This is a beautiful duo record with Pat Martino. He made a handful of wonderful records. Pat Martino and, oh, Gil Goldstein. This is so beautiful. You have Gil Goldstein's lush electric piano things with Pat Martino sort of musing. He was such a wonderful player. Only died recently. Records on the Embryo label. Miroslav Vitaus, this is more of a fusion record. Horace Arnold Tribe. Now, this is interesting because it's on Columbia. I remember when I was a kid, I tried to get into this. I, I couldn't get into it. It was too hip for me. This is slightly avant-garde. Dig the lineup. Drugs and long drums, Horace Arnold. Bass, George Moraz. Flute and sax, Joe Farrell. Tenor, Billy Harper. 12-string guitar, Ralph Towner. Ralph Towner's records on ECM are mini masterpieces. If you want to hear some of the most beautiful acoustic playing, nylon string guitar with John Christensen and a ECM Norwegian German rhythm section, those Ralph Towner albums are brilliant. And ECM, to be owned by a major corporation, is the worst example of reissuing records of any of these labels. They don't reissue shit. They don't care. I don't get it. Part of it is because ECM has a very ongoing, present, busy, modern, jazz, classical uh, department. They're constantly putting out really cool records, still very, very adventurous, but I wish they would reissue their catalog. It makes no sense that you can't find the ECM records. This is a reissue that I bought yesterday at the store, Creative, Creative Arts Ensemble, One Step Out. I'd never heard of this, but it includes I mostly bought it because Sonship Theus on drums is on this record. He he was, Sonship Theus is right up there with Alphonse Muzan and Eric Gravatt and Billy Cobham and all those early 70s players who was so progressive and so happening. I don't know the other guys on here. Keith Ruzadam, B.J. Crowley, Wilbert Helmsley, Gary Bias, Jeff Clayton, Al White. They even spelled Sonship, Sonship Theus wrong, Sonship Theus. Anyway, you can find this. This is not hard to find. It's on International Sounds. Uh, the Encounter label. This album was produced. Brown and Sir Franco was uh, Franco on keyboards. Was produced by Bernard Pretty Purdy, and this is one of the best examples of funky in the pocket driving Bernard Purdy records that I've heard. Even though he produced it, and there are no pictures of Purdy on the inside which is radical because you know purdy is all about promoting the pretty purdy but this record includes doug bascom on bass a string section yuma kraken on guitar rick cutler on vibes this is such a cool record i've never seen it before what did i pay for this 25 bucks 
uh, a little more mainstream, but also on Beehive, which did all sorts of jazz, Dizzy Reese, Manhattan Project, 1978, Clifford Jordan, Charles Davis, Albert Daly, Art Davis, Roy Haynes. Don't tell me the greatest players in jazz all left to Europe and weren't documented. This is an example of their being documented. There's really not that much out there with Dizzy Reese. Great record. I've got a few more. I hope you sense my excitement for these things. Because these records, first of all, they have that 70s sound, which can be kind of a flat sound, not a lot of reverb. A lot of close miking, small studios, everything is damped down. So you can really hear what's being played. It's not like a Rudy Van Gelder record where you're really hearing the studio as much as you are the, uh, the musicians. And most of these records are not recorded at Rudy Van Gelder's. O'Donnell Levy. Good Lord, what a funky, innovative, happening guitarist. Um, this is on Groove Merchant, Dawn of a New Day arranged and conducted by Manny Album. So we have a guy from the old school, the new old school, I think of Manny Album as a California big band guy. I could be wrong where he's from, but O'Donnell Levy, I'll tell you a story. Uh, for years, I would stay up late listening to Art Bell um, and they would have bumper music. And there was this funky, trippy thing. I could never figure out who it was. Uh, it sounded like average white band. It sounded just, it sounded really, it was so funky and had cool harmonies and a great melody. Um, and I finally looked, duh, at the website and it said who it was. And it was, an o it was the O'Donnell Levy version of a tune, which has been recorded by m other people on these rather esoteric labels. I think it's, and again, I don't have the title. I'll, I'll get the title and I'll put it down in the credits. But O'Donnell Levy, a brilliant, funky jazz guitarist. Another Bobby Pierce record. Frank Stozier, Billy Mitchell, Ken Dunbar, Bob Cranshaw, and Freddie Waits. The great Freddie Waits, his son Nasheed Waits, plays all over town, all over the world. Freddie Waits played both jazz and uh, he, I believe he's on some R&B hits. Beautiful record. This really blew my mind, the arrival of Bo Bobby Jones. On Cobblestone, Charles McPherson, Jackie Byard, Sue Evans on percussion, I believe, Bob Duro on vocals, Richard Davis on bass, and the great Mickey Rooker. This is a progressive early 70s jazz record that is just full of funk. 1972. We stole it out of the copy of the store. I bought it on uh, Discogs for 10 bucks. Great, great record. Calvin Keyes, who had records on uh, Black Jazz or Strata East. This was one of his later records on the Ovation label. Super crazy ass funky. Henry Franklin, a bass player who also had records on Strata East, I believe. This is after Strata East. Funky, intricate, a little spiritual soul jazz happening. Hadley Callaman. Uh, he's, this guy is kind of the lost thread. Um, this is on, on mainstream. His records are all 70s, but definitely what we would call spiritual jazz now, definitely progressive, definitely pushing the envelope, guys playing. Sonship Theus is on one of these records. Just a brilliant guy who sort of got lost in the wheels. He made about seven or eight records. He did tons of sideman work. If you look him up on Wikipedia, he's heavily, heavily recorded. And these are just fantastic records. Of all these records I'm showing you, these are the most progressive. There's another one on mainstream. Another Bobby Pierce record, Bobby Pierce on organ. This record, good God almighty, Neil Creaky, as his word is pronounced. I didn't know what to think of this. It's another cobblestone record, he plays organ. There are beautiful strings on this record. Some of it sounds like Stevie Wonder without the vocals doing jazz. What a beautiful, funky, soulful record this is. Sonny Phillips, I believe he's a keyboard player, Black Magic. Melvin Sparks, Ben Dixon, Buddy Caldwell, just funky, groovy, swinging jazz on Prestige. Another uh, Hadley Calman record on the Catalyst label. Catalyst were doing a lot of progressive recordings. Finally, Charles Sullivan on Inner City. Sort of spiritual, sort of progressive. Anyway, these records all really blew my mind. Um, Records, I used to see at the Jazz Record Center all the time. I haven't seen in 30 years. But if you go 
deep diving a little bit. I'm sure you can find these records for not much. You know, drive a little distance. There's an amazing store. It's a double decker in Pennsylvania. Probably worth checking out. Uh, Be Hard Bop, Bebop Records in Rochester. Anyway, this is a little trip of all these fantastic records from Xanadu, Inner City, Muse, Mainstream, Ovation. Great labels that don't get love, enough love. Are None of these records have been reissued. But I definitely suggest you search for them and check them out. Thanks for watching. Bye.